So, <clears throat> you know, uh, it's always such a hassle to go out and gather all those cattle and bring them into the corral to do whatever you got to do to them. So I said, hey, why don't we just take the squeeze chute out to the cattle and save ourselves a lot of trouble? So I did that. Here it is. And uh, you know what? We didn't get anything done. And, and here, here, here was the problem, is you can't ask a cow to go walk into the squeeze chute unless she doesn't have any other options. It just doesn't work. And so you can, you can, try, you can ask her, you can push her, you can get lots of help and do all the same thing, but it's not going to work. And the reason is she's not ready to get in that squeeze chute, and she's got lots of other options. And I, I don't like to brag, but our cows are living in cow heaven right now. We just delivered them to cow heaven. The grass is up to their briskets. The water is everywhere. The pastures are probably 25 sections apiece. They are in heaven. But as time goes by, we start gathering them in the fall, and they, their pastures get smaller and smaller, and pretty soon they're in the lot next to the corral. Then the next thing you know, they're in the corral. Then they're on a truck, and we steal their babies, and off they go home, the lucky ones. That's how, that's how you manage cattle, and that's how they manage you. So ask. Uh, ask yourself, what is the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, uh, GRSB? And uh, this part's familiar to a lot of you. It's a 501c. Now, I've always been saying it's a 501c3. It started out that way. Sometime they changed it to a 501c5. But it's a 501c5 nonprofit uh, charitable corporation. And you would know it like any other one. It has articles of incorporation. It's got bylaws, it's got members. It's got a lot of members, and they change. The membership changes, and it ebbs and flows, and there's sometimes there's more, and sometimes there's less. And sometimes I don't even know who some of those people are. But there's some critical ones, and they're, they work inside the supply chain, and then there's the, the mo probably the most critical ones work outside the supply chain and act upon the supply chain. An example might be the United Nations. So they, they have lots of lofty sounding ideas about and, and talk and pretty sounding language about what they do, but don't be fooled by that. It's not, they're not a, a marketing program that's gonna get you any money, extra money. You're not gonna get a premium. It's not a noble plan of any kind to feed the world, to save the planet. It's nothing about fairness or equity. It's nothing about a program driven by consumer choice and demand. And I'm going to say this right now before I forget to tell you. I just saw an article, I guess it was today, and it was an Australian article, and, it, and uh, McDonald's people in Australia are saying, you know, consumers don't give a damn about sustainable beef. They, they don't, uh, what they're worried about is trying to buy the next hamburger, and they're having a hard time doing that, and it doesn't, we can't charge them any more money to make them a sustainable hamburger. So after all this, which is what I knew, what you folks know, that, that's all nonsense, that's a lie. It's not about consumer demand, never was. And it's not about deforestation in some other uh, far off country. It's about your backyard, It's about what's going on right here. These are three of the actors in the supply, outside of the supply chain, the United Nations, I mentioned that, Rabobank, now, I don't mean to pick specifically on Rabobank. It's, they're a representative of a banking cartel. Lots of big banks, they're one of them. They're sitting on top of the beef supply chain, monitoring it for the benefit of the others. That's what they're doing. And the key chief actor in this whole thing is the World Wildlife Fund. Okay, they're the ones who drive it, they're the ones who put it together, no question about that. Nobody disputes that. World Wildlife Fund. 
this is a <coughs> the uh, guy who you the name or the face on the on the World Wildlife Fund organization that drives the global roundtable for sustainable beef. And I was uh, well ambivalent to find out he was still alive. I hadn't seen anything from him for quite a while, but he's still kicking. And I guess that's okay. Here's what he says about the global roundtable. I'll start that over. Our point is that consumers shouldn't have a choice about sustainability. And the way to do that is to get companies to only buy sustainable raw materials. We need to rehabilitate degraded and underperforming land to take pressure off of natural habitat. And we need to think about consumption. Some places need to consume more, others need to consume less. What it means is that you start <coughs> measuring what matters, you require third-party verification of that measurement, and you get producers started on a stepwise approach towards continuous improvement. Our approach has really been to work in the supply chain itself to help companies identify better sources, source from producers that are certified that have reduced measurably their It's all gone. Okay, how do I go backwards? Well, I guess so. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. There's a red button there. I just had to push it. To see what <laughs> <laughs> just had to. One of our, our strategies has always been to take choice away from consumers. Basically, our point is that consumers shouldn't have a choice about sustainability. And the way to do that is to get companies to only buy sustainable raw materials. We need to rehabilitate degraded and underperforming land to take pressure off of natural habitat. And we need to think about consumption. Some places need to consume more, others need to consume less. What it means is that you start measuring what matters, you require third-party verification of that measurement, and you get producers started on a stepwise approach towards continuous improvement. Our approach has really been to work in the supply chain itself to help companies identify better sources, source from producers that are certified, that have reduced measurably their environmental impacts, et cetera. What we've started doing is saying, okay, maybe sustainability isn't a competitive issue. Maybe consumers shouldn't have choice about sustainability. Maybe all the products on the shelf ought to be sustainable. How do we make that happen? We make that happen by getting companies to collude around sustainability. You start measuring what matters you require third-party verification of that measurement. Once we start measuring stuff, we'll start managing it. Well, I could have stood up here and tried to explain that to you, but this is a, that's an admission. That should, should be enough to send this guy to jail on his own admission. But that, that's what they're doing with the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. He means when they start measuring stuff, they can start managing you. That's what he means. So and he, he mentioned the word collusion. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a mistake. It's a favorite word of his. He says it in several different videos. He was very proud of it for a while. Now he says something a little more innocuous. It's not quite as uh, edgy, not quite as incriminating, but uh, like a cooperation or something is what he says now. Collusion, secret or illegal cooperation or conspiracy, especially in order to cheat or deceive others. Now, I, for one, get tired of telling people information and if it's some information that they've never heard of before from some newscaster they recognize their first reaction is to call me a conspiracy theorist but this is exactly what they're doing he's admitting it himself he's a conspiracy he's an actor in a conspiracy and uh, you know there's laws against conspiracy there's people get indicted mobsters are always getting indicted for conspiracy so it, it shouldn't be that foreign a concept. But when people call you a conspiracy theorist, what they really are telling you is it's an attack on you, your, your person. It's like saying uh, your grandma wears army boots. It's like uh, it's an attack on you, not the idea. Not, so there's, there's an argument. There's an argument ad hominem. That's against the man. That's what this is, calling somebody a conspiracy theorist. And there's an argument ad rem, or to the thing. Now, <coughs> uh, I try to train them back to say, okay, you're smarter than that, surely you're smarter than that. 
why don't you try and address the issue, okay? Don't call me names, why don't you try and address the issue? So he's the vice president of market transformation. What do you think that means? I'll tell you what it means. It's an unwavering mission of theirs to transform your market from a free market economy into a command and control communist serfdom. That's what it is. That's what, that he will have done his job as vice president of market transformation when he accomplishes that. So here's what they're doing in a uh, nutshell uh, and <coughs> compiling what it is that he already said. How they're going to do this is they're going to inflict mandatory RFID on your cattle. They're going to require you to register your premises and record cattle movements. They're going to impose totally unnecessary environmental and social governance, ESG. Environmental and social regulation. And they're going to make you comply, and they're going to make you prove your compliance by you hiring a third-party verifier, a contractor, that will go out with a checklist they give the contractor. And they take that, con that checklist out there, and they go down the checklist, and if you comply, then you get a certification. And if you get a certification, you can market that ear tag number. And if not, you don't get to. It's that simple. No certification, no market access. And the whole process is subject to what they call continuous improvement. And what that means is once they get started, they get you started complying, they will make compliance more and more stringent, more and more difficult, ratchet up the tension until they have you where they want you, in the squeeze chute. And just in case you think they really do kind of love agriculture and agriculture ranchers. Agriculture has the largest impact on the planet of any human activity. Here's some of the issues. It's the largest cause of deforestation. It's the largest cause of biodiversity loss. It uses more water than any other human activity. In fact, twice as much as all other human activities combined. We take about one liter of water today to make one calorie of food. It produces more pollution than any other human activity. It uses more chemicals. It produces more greenhouse gases. In fact, the greenhouse gas production just from clearing forest to create new land to farm each year is equal to all transportation greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. I've worked with the biggest multinational food companies on the planet, and this is what I've found. If we don't get where and how we produce food right in the next 40 years, we can turn out the light and go home. Because the planet that we call our own is not going to be recognized. Right now, we're eating the planet. Agriculture is the biggest threat. OK, so we're, we're serving up the planet. So we're eating the planet. He. he, he it, it, the absurdity of that just is without real measure. You know, what would he rather do with that water than you grow food to eat? What would he rather do with that? So what is the World Wildlife Fund? It's a phony. It's an imposter. Posing as an organization that cares about wildlife. And why is that? Because they can get a, not so much the money, because they won't really need the money so much. But what they get when they act like they care about wildlife is well-meaning people who want to save little furry animals. And they get what they get is a constituent base. They get a bunch of people that are on their side because they think, because these guys are lying to them, they think that World Wildlife Fund is out to save wildlife. And that's not the case, okay? They are political activists, political terrorists. So. World Wildlife Fund collusion in the Global Roundtable. World Wildlife Fund collusion in the Global Roundtable. We actually need collusion around sustainability at every level with every type of institution. Where do we start? Who do we work with? How do we work on these issues? This is new ground for us. So we decided we needed to map it out. There's 6.8 billion consumers, give or take, maybe closer to seven today. 
Do we work with all those? Do we work with the 1.4 billion producers of all these different products? Do we change the way they produce things? Or do we focus on the narrower neck, the pinch point in each of these commodities where 300 to 500 companies control 70 to 80 percent of each of those 15 commodities that we care about? We decided that this is the strategy that we could actually get our arms around. So, <clears throat> and folks who have seen this presentation before have seen this slide, but you can't see it too often. It's the most important slide in uh, not just this program, but in any program I've seen in a long time. Okay, so what this is telling you is that they have recognized that if they can grab a hold of the supply chain at its narrowest point, they can control what goes in, and what goes up and down the supply chain. Buyers, sellers, it doesn't matter. And they do that by enlisting the help of investors. For the bankers, that's what they are. Now, this may sound intuitive, and it is, but there's really two sources of money that operate on a large enough scale to, to help run those co corporations. One of them is new money, all right? That's from the banks. The other one is what? Old money. Existing money, money that's already in circulation. And right, so like, uh, consider that um, aggregated savings. And you think, who's got the most of that of anybody? It's BlackRock. You've got trillions of dollars in aggregated sa savings, assets under investment. So they have enlisted the help of the um, Securities and Exchange Commission who have interposed themselves between business and the money as a gatekeeper. And they've been imposed in there also, the bankers. So they have basically blocked the path of clear, clean flow of money from businesses uh, to the supply of money. And that's what that means. So here's a, in a moment of candor, uh, Tyson Foods guy, he was, uh, he's Australian. He says, right now, access to finance is be by far our biggest driver for sustainability. So why would these corporations do that? Because if they don't do this uh, kabuki dance, this sustainability thing, if they don't do it, the bankers and the institutional investors <coughs> aren't going to give them any money. If they don't give them any money, their business goes broke. And their shareholders are mad. So that's why they do that, is because that, that's what they got to do, OK? This is the headline to another same article, maybe a different one. Access to finance is the biggest driver. Well, they'd all say that. This guy was just stupid enough to say it in public. So here are the Packers. Cargill, Tyson, Marfrig, which is a Brazilian company, bought National Beef and JBS. The four of them together kill 85% of the cattle. So you've got to market your cattle through them. This is the narrow point of the, narrow, the, the pinch point, the choke point of the supply chain. That's where they can grab control of the entire beef supply chain, including hundreds of thousands of ranches, hundreds of thousands of consumers. These are working inside the supply chain. So <coughs> the, the, this is the member of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef that's indispensable to the, their success, okay? It's the beef checkoff. And it's the NCBA, and you ask yourself, why are they so indispensable? Because they make it look like you guys are in favor of all this. They act like they are on your side. They are not on your side, okay? They are, they pretend to represent fairly the entire gate to place, uh, farm to fork. So they, they pretend that they can re, uh, represent fairly the ranchers and the packers. And I'll tell you right now, ranchers and packers are opponents on the opposite sides of the bargaining table. And they cannot do that. So when push comes to shove, who do they represent? They represent the packers. That's right. And th they represent uh, producers only when they absolutely have to, to save face. And the beef checkoff, of course, the magic of that is that you guys finance all their business. You, you guys pay for it all. 
This was, an, this was a 2013 brochure that shows that the Beef Checkoff is working hand in hand with the World Wildlife Fund to put on some seminars, some workshops on sustainability. So <coughs> you'd think NCBA would say something like, gee, this isn't helping anybody. And what you, you run through the whole paradigm and you go, well, it's not really, that's not what we're supposed to be worrying about. What we're supposed to be worrying about is where are these guys gonna get their next investment? And that's from the banks. And who are the banks? That's actually World Wildlife Fund. They published this magazine, and you can get this online, and I, I, I recommend that you read it. <coughs> it's uh, 40 pages of uh, elegantly done nonsense. And I know it's nonsense because there's lots of pretty girls wearing pastel colors with white hats pulled down over their eyes riding horses. Uh, slowly. So <coughs> uh, one of the things that is uh, knitted all the way through the, the language of the Global Roundtable is the, what we is called the five freedoms. Now that's what that was was uh, part of the animal uh, rights movement, uh, I think about in the 70s. But all animals are supposed to have freedom from what? Hunger, malnutrition, and thirst. Well, if, you don't, we aren't, if they don't have that, we're not in business, right? Fear, freedom from fear and distress, freedom from physical and thermal discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, and disease, and freedom to express normal patterns of behavior. All this sounds really good, except for <coughs> it's in kind of in the eyes of the beholder. Because if, if every time you go, yeah, cow, what you're doing is you're scaring that cow. And if if uh, I may think that that's sort of a minimal in imposition, but someone who was a diehard animal rights uh, advocate might think that that was not that animal's not free from fear if as long as what I'm doing is scaring them when I'm yelling at. Them. So you can see the problem that this that comes about here, but this is laced all the way through the literature of the Global Roundtable, and the NCBA has the audacity to say that this organization is driven and motivated by animal rights groups. The new, uh, the new NCBA president is a rank embarrassment to the state of Wyoming. He's, uh, <coughs> I'm gonna challenge him to a cage fight. <laughs> a, a round cage. Because I know that somebody's eventually gonna tell him to take a seat in the corner and he's, it's, he's not gonna be able to deal with that. Whereupon I will, I will beset him with uh, uh, necessary moves to put him out of business. Oh, he, he, what's that? Okay, <laughs> tag team, okay, tag team. So, uh, you know, this is important because if they wanna put you out of business, one of the ways they can do that is allege that you are not complying with the five freedoms. Here was a, this is a, something I found a few years back. It's a NCBA sent me this sticker, NCBA, which I also found out was the National Chil Chinchilla Breeders Association. <laughs> and I kind of look at one, you know, they kind of look like chinchillas. But the, you can see the remarkable similarity between their logo and the Humane Society's logo. And I don't think that's an accident. So <coughs> let's, since we're talking about collusion, and now we're gonna start talking about traceability, let's talk a little bit about that. We, and I'll bring you up to date on what happened. So that the USDA APHIS just finalized a rule requiring for the first time radio frequency identification on cattle. So I, I think I'll get this right and say, aged 18 months old or older, intact, cattle crossing state lines plus rodeo cattle plus like uh, show cattle and bison I think that's about it so for the first time now they, before they can move across state lines they have to have a radio frequency ear tag you don't have to read it with a radio reader you they have a visual component to them and you can 
it's okay if the, the RFID tag is read visually, but I mean, that's a, <coughs> it's a, they're harder to read than a regular bang tag because they're round and they're uh, full of earwax and <coughs> buried deep in their ear. But, uh, and you don't, there's not even a requirement that you, ear, that all the cows have them. If your cow has a bangs tag now, she's kind of grandfathered in or grandmothered in. She doesn't need an ear tag. Unless she doesn't have an ear tag, then you got a tag. But <coughs> before she can go across the line, she has to have one even if you're not going to use it. So wh what APHIS did was they tried to grab the whole, they tried to stuff the cow in the squeeze chute while she was still in the pasture. Ten years ago, 12 years ago, with a program they called NAIDS, National Animal Identification System. They tried to ear tag RFID every single critter on the place, including grandma's donkey, okay? Everything. Chickens. I'm not kidding. They wanted to RFID chickens. And there was a massive up, uprising. The, the cows revolted. Uh, they didn't go in the squeeze chute. They ran over the top of them. They, uh, they went back to the in, uh, USDA APHIS, went back to the drawing board. And they've been back several times with different proposals. Every time they get uh, uh, stampeded. So what they did here with this rule is they grabbed granny gear. Low, low. They put it in low. And they said, we are going to offend the least possible number of people. No one can be offended by this new rule. Because it doesn't change anything that anybody does. I mean, it's just the way it is. It's not, I mean, nobody gets inconvenienced by this new rule. And, of course, they don't mean that. What they mean to do is they need, mean to ratchet up either the classes of cattle that are going to be ear tagged or the circumstances, uh, like, instead of just crossing state lines, intrust state. Uh, but they intend to expand that to the point where all cattle are ear tagged, okay? All, all cattle, every circumstance. And, and then the terms and conditions that I set out earlier are applicable. So premises registration, uh, movements, you know, m probably uh, the sky's the limit in terms of what they're going to impose on that. If it, every time you treat an animal, every time one dies, every time it gets in with the neighbors, every time the neighbors get in with you, you got to report all that. I think the original NACE uh, program had like, uh, oh God, at least a, def a dozen different reporting requirements. So <coughs> this is why, actually I put this piece, particular piece of paper. This was, they announced this, uh, this is the NCBA had a statement on the, on the USDA's rule. They came out with a statement. January 18, 2023, that was last year. So <coughs> there, of course, they were in favor. But, <coughs> uh, and they make a big deal out of being grassroots. This, all their policy comes from the grassroots up. It doesn't come from the top down. So one of the things is in, that's in this list, that they, they said, well, we're going to review this rule on January 18th. We're going to review this, make sure it meets all of our criteria. So one of the criteria is it's got to be compatible with the general traceability principles of the World Organization for Animal Health, which is the United Nations. So I'm wondering which ranchers went to one of their meetings and said, you know, as a grassroots movement, I want to make sure that our traceability rule is in compliance with the world, what is it, World Health, World, world Organization for Animal Health. N none of them did that. And how, how would you, seriously, if you were an advocate for the, for the industry, for the beef producers, how would you advocate that their, their rules be in compliance with the United Nations, not even including the language of that regulation. So if the, if the WOHA changes their rule, I gotta change my rule now? I mean, is that what that means? And they wanna utilize the low cost uh, electronic ear tagging devices paid for by the federal and state funds, if that's possible. Well. All right, so here's the actual rule announced the rule. It was published, this publication date, is the day after the NCBA made their comment. So the NCBA had to know they were in, they, I mean, there was collusion between the USDA 
and the NCBA for them to publish that information prior to the publication of the rule. The NCBA, kind of like the WWF, is an imposter posing as an organization that cares about cattlemen. What they really are is an organization that's driven to advance the pur purposes of the packers. So <coughs> now I want to talk to you about something. I, I raised this subject last year and didn't really talk about it much, but there's a, uh, there's a movement called One Health. I'd, I'd be curious to know if anybody, I mean, uh, just for my own inventory, does anybody, has anybody ever heard of that or read about it, know anything about it? Okay. So, <coughs> uh, geez, it's a, all right, here's what happened. In 2003, there's a guy named William Karish. He's a veterinarian, works for EcoHealth Alliance. EcoHealth Alliance, if you've been paying attention, is the outfit that was receiving money from the federal government to do the research at Wuhan lab in China. So they were doing gain of function research in China, paid for by United States government funds, primarily from the State Department and from the Department of Defense to the tune of at least, that can be identified, at least $100 million. So he comes up with an idea called One Health. And One Health, there's nothing new about the idea of One Health. I, the idea of One Health is that there's an interface between animals and people and the environment and plants and variously some other things, but we're all interconnected in that any kind of health consideration that affects one of those organizations, or one of those contingencies, affects them all. Well, that is 100 years old for context. And, <coughs> you know, you could go back to uh, brucellosis, because there's a human form. There's, it certainly appears in elk. It's in cattle. And, th and those respective scientists, doctors and veterinarians and scientists, environmental scientists, have been working on cooperating with each other to manage that disease ever since they were aware there was a disease. Another example is uh, uh, mad cow disease. So in, in wildlife, it's called uh, chronic wasting disease. In <coughs> cervids, in deer and elk, um, called uh, Jakob's Crutchfield or something like that in humans. And it's called uh, uh, BSE in cattle. Well, it's the same deal. These guys have worked together to do this forever. And for him to say, I know, let's, let's have everybody work together is just a non-idea. A non it isn't an idea, it's not a new idea, it's an old idea. It's one that everyone has been doing ever since, ever since forever, okay? So, <coughs> uh, but that's his idea. We need one help. And so uh, you can read now, by now, several thousand pages of information written by various think tanks, various organizations about how to advance the idea of One Health. And, <coughs> and it's a, one, the one, is, the one paper is more spectacular than the last, but it's all the same gobbledygook about you gotta work at the interface. That's what we know, we already know that, it's not new. So uh, only, but it, and they say stuff like only if by working to a One Health uh, program can we can we conquer these diseases. Well, uh, so that was in 2003. He came up with that, and they, he developed that and he pushed it. And um, he works for again Eco Health Alliance at Wuhan, China. Or w that that's working out of Wuhan. And with his One Health idea, he manages to get on the State Department on board. So in about 2011, State Department puts on a uh, symposium requiring, or not requiring, but proposing that they come up with a governance, with a governmental strategy for advancing the cause of One Health. So you can go from 2001 to, to present day, and in 2001 there was like two meetings that year. 
And you can look and then like in 2007, there might have been seven. In 2011, there was probably 10. If you look at there for 2023, there's probably 150 <coughs> meetings about how to advance the One Health program. So what, what they've done is that they've, in, they've forced that One Health idea into every aspect of government. There's now 20 different United States government programs, counting USDA, counting Forest Service, uh, Bureau, <coughs> excuse me, Bureau of Land Management, the CDC, the pick one, name one, FDA, uh, United States Geological Survey, 20 different agencies that now have One Health programs. And uh, they forced it into academia, and there are so just so many colleges, universities that have a One Health lens or One Health program, including Michigan State that has a One Health for your 4-H kitties. So they'll teach your 4-H kitties how to, you know, hit the sweet spot between caring for animals, caring for people, caring for wildlife, caring for bugs. So, <coughs> uh, and I don't know if any of you folks have been paying attention to the pandemic treaty that uh, the World Health Organization has been negotiating that would give that organization broad, broad powers to, to govern, to manage um, the next pandemic. But what they, <coughs> what they say in their literature now is that if once we get all this in, in, uh, inculcated into the governmental agencies and the, and the companies, okay, and the universities and into individual people, then we tie that all back into the World Health Organization and their pandemic treaty. So now there's a straight shot transmission of policy from the World Health Organization to the level, the most local level of policy. So I, I, I urge you when you go home, get out your Google, look up One Health and just start reading something because you're not gonna be able to read very much without getting sick to your stomach because it's just so stupid. I mean, it is so not really an idea. But it's, it's governance, okay, it's policy. And this policy is coming from the top down. And, <coughs> and it's so consistent with so many different policies that we are dealing with that don't have a thing to do with advancing our interests. And somewhere along the line, we, we got lost looking for policy that was looking out for us. And instead what we're getting is stuff that makes no sense. Or it doesn't seem to make sense unless you, unless you go, oh, well, now wait a minute, let me think about this. They're not, they don't care about us, they care about themselves and they're globalist in orientation. So if you wanna know what makes sense, ask yourself, what would be good if you were a globalist, how would you run this issue? And that starts making sense, okay? And I'll invoke a football analogy, so the quarterback takes a snap, drops back, linebackers rushing him, he's got two men open, and he flips the football to the linebacker. The linebacker runs it in the other way for a touchdown. You go, that doesn't make any sense. But then later you find out the linebacker and the quarterback were both taking money under the table. Now it makes sense. I see what they're doing. So <coughs> watch this, pay attention to this trend, the One Health thing. It, we could kill it in the cradle now if people would get out and do it and expose it for what it is. But you, you're gonna have to go home and educate yourselves, read about One Health, see what it's doing. It ties directly into the, one, into the pandemic treaty and it goes all the way down to the fundamental levels of government and education and brainwashing your kids. So here's, they, they, uh, <coughs> okay, the UN came out with last year, they announced the quadripartite, which sounds very impressive. It's four major organizations at the United Nations. It's World Health Organization, it's uh, World Organization for Animal Health, United Nations Environmental Program, and Food and Agriculture Organization. So that's the quadripartite. And they, you can read thousands of pages that these people are writing about this. So you gotta do that, okay, you gotta do that. This is the next big thing. 
Let me talk about traceability. It's so, it's so important. If, the, with they don't, if you don't have traceability, if they don't have electronic traceability, they can't run your ranch. And if they've got it, they can, especially with a situation where they've got four packers that are colluding daily in the purchase of your product. So there's a, if they got the proper mix of collusion and market concentration, and they got mandatory full chain traceability, they can run your place for you. I don't know how to go back. So <coughs> uh, Sustainable Agricultural Initiative was one of the original members of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. They came up with a checklist, very extensive, including uh, the first requirement, the initial requirement, is that all the animals on the place are, had to be full chain traceability, individually identified, fallen from birth to, to uh, every stage of its life. And <coughs> Sustainable Agricultural Initiative was actually the work product of Nestle, Unilever, and Dan and Yogurt. They, those people don't sell any beef. What are they trying to do? Why are they, why are they setting the terms and conditions for raising beef? And the answer is, I won't let you think about that too long. The answer is because they don't want beef to prosper. They want to put beef out of business and they want to stand in the place when the consumers go looking for whatever's next, they want to be there in that place. And that's what they say in this one letter. Uh, <coughs> in many countries, consumers are not fully prepared to replace or reduce meat in their diets. Our focus is to innovate great tasting solutions to encourage consumers to try them and over time make small sustainable shifts toward a higher plant-based, more balanced diet. So the, the, I put this in, this is proof, it's an important slide also. It's proof that the Global Roundtable has, doesn't intend to advance the cause of beef production. They intend to kill beef production. Ireland last year, or two years ago, uh, time flies, finally came up with a uh, mandatory R RFID requirement. And it was within the same year they started adv advancing the cause of, of depopulating cattle. One year's time. There's an, there's an organization called the Sustainable Source uh, Institute, S S Sustainable A Trade Initiative. And <coughs> they put out an owner's manual on how to advance traceability in your supply chain. <coughs> and there's a, there's a paragraph in there that says any, any sourcing from anonymous commodity markets does not provide your company with a realistic possibility to impact the farmer's practices owing to the lack of traceability or transparency. Well, what that is the flip side, okay? If they don't, they're, they're complaining, they're whining, they're warning their members that if you don't have traceability, you can't control the farmer. But if you have traceability, you can control them absolutely. So <coughs> this is the newest member of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Because we, uh, and it's important to note that they quit talking about ear tags in the terms of RFID, now there's just EID, okay? Electronic identification, not radio frequency, because that's more specific. The EID is just electronic. So uh, right now, the 840 tag, which is the uh, RFID tag that's out there, th that's what they're talking about. But they've left themselves the opening to change the technology at will without any opportunity to say anything about it. And this company called Series Tag makes <coughs> a direct to satellite ear tag that will upload transmit uh, information about your cow. It, when you, bound it, you, you put it on the cow, same as you would different ear tags. Upload directly to the satellite. No towers, no no, no cell phone, no nothing directly to the tower. Fancy damn tag, I'll tell you what. <coughs> Here's one of them. This one says, it says, monitor your animals, secure your property, and understand your impact with series tag. And here's their best tag, their most sophisticated one. It comes in at a low, low 660. 60 bucks a tag. So in the interest of sustainable uh, sustain sustainability and continuous improvement, there is nothing keeping the USDA 
or any of the companies from saying, this is the tag you will use now. Now, can you afford that? I mean, forget the fact that they would know every single thing you were doing with that cow and would be with idle time on their hands, free to come up with ideas on how to manage your time. Could you pay for that tag? So 660 bucks a tag. But that's the newest member of the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. So <coughs> this is a, it's a, the problem was that obvious. But if, if what I'm saying is true, wouldn't somebody be telling you that on the news? Wouldn't there be somebody saying, hey, listen, here's what's going on. And our friend Jim Mumford pointed out that <coughs> the Farm Journal got $400 million for $40 million from the federal government for what I'm not, it's not clear. But I can tell you what that's for is so that they manage the news that they report. And there is collusion rampant among media, rampant. And here's, here's a six, six news companies control 90% of the content of news. So it's not just the news they tell you, it's the news they don't tell. And you, we're, we're flying blind. And, and this is, doesn't even talk about the collusion that's present in uh, internet media. Facebook, Google, Apple. He's not even talking about that. I mean, th that's in addition to this. Here's an example. Hi, I'm Fox San Antonio's Jessica Headley. And I'm Ryan Wolf. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is, is to, to serve, serve our Treasure Valley community. To deal past illustrious this communities, Eastern Iowa communities, Mid Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that City of Four News produces. But we are concerned about trouble and trying to be responsible one sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish these same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of bias and false, false news has, has become, become all too common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media outlets extremely dangerous to our democracy. This is 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 extremely dangerous to our democracy. Uh, those are all, those news stations were all owned by Sinclair Broadcasting. And, and they, it's a great example of how controlled the media content can be. And it was a brilliant job of editing by I wish I could tell you who. Okay, six companies are even easier to get your arms around. I'm gonna skip these two. Or I mean, I'll just touch on them. Okay, th there's a lot of talk in there about public-private partnerships. Uh, you know, those are bad. They make it sound like it's an efficiency somehow, but those are bad, y you know. Uh, they get government funding, but then they can hand off important parts of the, their work to the private sector and then be immune from Freedom of Information Act. So you don't get to know what's going on there. They're advancing a cause. Continuous improvement, I've, I think I've touched on that. The checklist, these are, this is the checklist of, from the Sustainable Agricultural Initiative. It touches, it does about 40 different points. And getting down to very, uh, specific aspects of your operations that they that you have to verify for them and you you know you you're, where you locate your buildings is an example uh, are you coaching little league are you doing things in your community to make uh you know make yourself more sustainable you, you got to prove those things to them that's what they want you to do so <coughs> the uh the whole vision and the vision and mission statement for the global roundtable 
is plagiarized in large measure from the Soviet Constitution. And, it, and I say, God bless them, why, why reinvent the wheel? I mean, some of those, those commies back in the early 1900s were smart and they came up with all this great stuff. Why not just go ahead and steal it outright and make that your vision statement? Because that's what they did. And that's where the continuous improvement comes from. And that's where uh, environmental, environmentally sound, socially responsible, all that kind of nonsense. So the thing about continuous improvement is it doesn't matter where you start so long as you get started somewhere. And, and what they do is they ratchet it all the way back until you won't resist. And then once you start, just incrementally. And so <coughs> it's kind of like the cow in the squeeze chute. If you, when you put her in the corral, she's probably not going to complain. You put her in the alley, she's probably not going to complain too much. You start, start her down the, the alley to the squeeze chute, she might balk a little bit. You get her in the you get her in the squeeze chute, and you can do whatever you want to with her. And there's a one friend of mine says it's it's like stealing your baloney one slice one slice at a time. Okay, that's what this is about. That's continuous improvement. So <coughs> uh, last year, the Biden government came, the Biden administration came out with the building a bio workforce of the future. They, this is in, as it applies to us. We're talking about fake meat. Um, <coughs> there's a Nobody's eating the fake meat, by the way. No one is eating it. But that doesn't mean that they're not still pumping money into fake meat. It's mostly going into the United States is the uh, biggest, uh, I don't want to say market, but producer of fake meat, where most of the research, most of the money is going. Israel is a close second. So the little country of Israel is building it uh, toward the ability to own the protein supply. And <coughs> they, uh, I get there's a publication I get that talks about the fake meat industry that's broken down into, you know, uh, lab grown, plant based, blah, blah. Their <coughs> investors have kind of pulled back their horns and they're not jumping in right now, but there is, they, uh, this, this program was like 225 million from the government. There's 43 billion in what they call dry powder, waiting for the circumstances to come to present themselves so that they can put their money in, start making fake meat. The, a guy named Ian Davis, who's a Brit and uh, brilliant, I think, but he put this chart together. You can get it off the internet too. But it shows, it shows who's making policy and who's taking the policy. And so if, uh, you got to follow the money. It's the banks, naturally, that are doing the policy. And the, the second step down is the central bank, like the European Union or the uh, – oh, I can't think of it right now. But the Federal Reserve, the European equivalent of it, um, of cent various central banks, then they are all under the umbrella of the bank for international settlement. So, uh, you know, people talk about they. They are doing this. They are doing that. That's they. Okay, now, if you want to take the time to figure out who the people are, the actual personalities, we might be able to learn something. You know, uh, below them is organizations like the World Wildlife Fund, or excuse me, the World Economic Forum, the Co Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House, that's, Bob knows about Chatham House. Uh, <coughs> it's the, uh, the uh, royal family in England, the Rockefellers. So he calls those people think tanks and global representative groups. And those above that first bracket there, that comprises the policy makers. Okay, then there's the policy distributors, the people who are handing that out once they get it. United Nations, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, World Health Organization, a lot of NGOs. And the enforcers, you've got the national governments that are, that are stepping in to provide the muscle. Uh, then you've got the people that are propagandizing the policy. That's your news media, the people who are ex extremely dangerous for the democracy. Then you got the guys who are, who are taking it on the chin, that's us, okay? Now, <coughs> you may quibble with this exact organization, and I might even here and there, but uh, I urge you to look this up, find this, Ian Davis is his name, uh, and read that and see, that that's where it comes from. So, so when you go, this doesn't make any sense, this policy is stupid. Well, if you think about it from their perspective and where it's coming from, 
It's not stupid. It's in their best interest. It's just not in your best interest. So <coughs> we got to start talking about policy because that's what that you know. It's not necessarily government, but it's the policy that's that's being handed down to us, and none of it makes any damn sense. And I, uh, I'm going to put a wrap on this in a second, but <coughs> you know. Uh, like the policy involving, uh, okay, the George Floyd riots. Wh wh where in the world did that come from? The idea that uh, George Floyd gets killed and now it's okay the next day to have riots all the way around the world. Did you know, because it's true, George Floyd and the cop who was sitting on him when he died named Derek Chauvin, that they worked as bouncers in the same bar. In a town of three and a half million people Somehow, those two people found each other. That thing precipitated. And the next day, they were <coughs> throwing riots, throwing bricks through windows that had been delivered for that purpose by somebody. Okay, so that was not a spontaneous event in my estimation. Or, or if it was, somebody needs to explain to me, how could it possibly be that those two guys knew each other? How could that possibly be? How could it possibly be that somebody is delivering a pallet of bricks to a riot? without anybody asking any further questions. Bank digital currencies, that policy, who said that that was a good idea? The idea that everybody gets one bank account at the Federal Reserve, all your money goes there. They can, they can regulate how you use that money. They can tell you how far you away from home you can be when you can spend your money, or whether you already bought a tank of gas this week, or whether you're eligible for a steak this week because you had one last month. Central bank digital currency. Thinks that's a good idea. Well, obviously they do. Does it benefit us? I could go on. You know, <coughs> uh, here's the thing about ranchers: is by and large, we are tied to the land, and that gives us it grounds us. It gives us a. a a natural advantage because we know about the circle of life and we know that you have to maintain a good relationship with God and decency and justice and fairness or the world will collapse and we are fighting people that are trying to take that away from us and they're doing it in an organized deliberate fashion. If anybody has any questions, I'd be pleased to answer them. <coughs>